Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. Today, I've got a little bit of a different episode for you. An interesting thought exercise about careers is how to maximize your career potential. Some problems that we have when we start our career are things like, how do I know if what I'm doing is, is what I'm meant to be doing? Am I doing something that, that is really matched to my skill set? Am I going to kind of maximize my potential by doing this thing long into the future? And there are a lot of schools of thought and ways of approaching this problem. But today's episode, we're going to do a really deep dive into the different ways of looking at this problem and the different perhaps learnings that we can have and, and, and the things that we can take from these learnings and apply to our careers so that we can go about planning our career and, and being more effective in making decisions about which industry we're going to go in, what sort of role we're going to take, you know, we, so we can make those decisions more effectively. Um, today's episode, we're looking at the idea of a hill climb. And then we're going to look at the 10,000 hours rule uh, and how that applies. And then finally, we're going to finish off looking at range and how that is really the, the underpinning of a lot of these concepts that we'll talk about in today's episode. There's a lot of value in this episode and, and, and a lot of great takeaways that can help you in, in planning your career and in helping you decide you know, what industry, what sort of job are you going to pursue as you go and start your career and wherever you may be. So let's get started. And one, one of the things I want to start with today is this idea of a hill climb. And I mentioned it before, but a hill climb is essentially, you know, we want to climb, imagine we've got lots of hills, we kind of want to climb to the highest hill. To explain this better, We've got Chris Dixon, who's going to explain this concept of a hill climb. Uh, number two, um, don't climb the wrong hill. Uh, I speak a lot to um, uh, young people who are thinking about joining startups and trying to sort of recruit them. And I see a very common pattern, which is uh, people get stuck in fields uh, that they don't like because they feel like they're making incremental day-to-day uh, -day progress. I think a good um, analogy or for sort of uh, understanding this concept is one that comes from computer science. It's a sort of known as hill climbing algorithms. Um, describe this briefly. Imagine a sort of landscape, a hilly landscape with various, some tall hills and, and shorter hills. And your goal is sort of to find the highest hill. And that might be, you know, whatever your, your personal goal is. Um, and what, and, and what tends to happen, I think, is that, um, especially this happens with ambitious people, is that the lure of taking a step upward on the, on the current hill is very strong. And it's very hard to sort of step back and um, go and explore and look at other hills. What computer science teaches you is that the optimal algorithm for finding the highest hill uh, is to uh, meander, explore a lot, especially early on, uh, occasionally drop yourself into random places around the terrain. And when you find the highest hill, uh, pursue it, no matter how uh, uh, attractive the, the, the upward step of the current hill might appear. So we can split up the hill climbing analogy into two key things, okay? The first is finding the hill, okay? So which hill are we gonna climb? Let's first try and find the hill that has kind of the highest peak, uh, you know, and the peak in, in a sense is, like Chris said, whatever our goals are for our career. You know, we kind of want to maximize whatever it is. It might be money or status or whatever. Uh, it may be that, or it might just be happiness, fulfillment, etc. Okay, and so the hill, uh, the, the height of the hill kind of represents that. And the first part of this is working out which hill is the highest, okay? How can we go about doing that? And the second thing that we can break this into is actually climbing the hill itself. Okay, climbing the hill itself. And and how can we go about doing that? In order to climb the hill, one way to do this that's really become popularized in the last few years is this idea of the 10,000 hour rule. So the 10,000 10, hour rule basically says that if you pursue something for 10,000 hours, you know, you will eventually become world class at that thing and and, and you know, we'll, you'll have the rewards associated with that. This idea was first popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, and we've got him here to explain that for you. This is something actually I spend a lot of time on in, in Outliers, um, this notion of how long it takes to be good. Because a lot of psychologists have actually attacked this question and have discovered something they call the 10,000 hours rule, 
which says that when we look at a wide variety of cognitively complex activities, we find a, 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 a very consistent pattern. And that is, it seems to be impossible to achieve any kind of true expertise unless you have practiced for 10,000 hours. And 10,000 hours, if you think about it, think of that as four hours a day, is 10 years. The 10 year rule shows up in almost everything. We look at, for example, um, chess grandmasters. There's only ever been one chess grandmaster in history who has achieved that level without having played chess for 10 years. And that was Bobby Fischer, who became a grandmaster after nine years. You can take um, lovely studies of classical music composers. Uh, you take the whole, you, you, you see what is the first piece of music they wrote that was truly great. That was one of their kind of signature pieces. And it has never been the case that a truly world-class piece, piece of classical music has been composed before the composer was composing for 10 years. Now, people always say, well, what about Mozart? Well, was Mozart composing in his, at 10 and 11 years old? Absolutely. Have you ever listened to the things he was, he was composing at 10 and 11? They're terrible. He wasn't any good until he was 23 and writes Concerto Number 9, 271. So the core understanding and learning that we get from listening to Malcolm talk about the 10,000 hour rule is that if we want to achieve really high levels of success in a certain area, we need to be really focused on one thing for 10,000 hours. And this roughly equates to about 10 years of working on just that thing. So the examples he gave were in music, uh, where you know certain musicians had, had been working on their craft for at least 10 years uh, before they produced something that was truly, truly incredible. You know, and how do we apply this to careers? Well, perhaps according to this metho methodology, you know, it, it's gonna take 10 years in your in your job so whether you're a programmer or an analyst or whatever 10 years for you to become like a world class at that thing is this the right approach and 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 does the 10,000 hour rule kind of apply across these fields like music and chess into something that is a little bit less well defined you know like the workplace you know, and it's, it's interesting to think about because certainly there is some merit. You know, if, if you're going to do the same thing for 10 years, you're going to be good at it, right? Um, and, and, and it's interesting to think about that. But I want to follow Malcolm's piece up with, with some little pieces now from Bill Gates and Tim Ferriss. And they have some interesting comments on the 10,000 hour rule. In, uh, we can start with Bill Gates and hear his thoughts and then we'll hear from Tim. If somebody reads the book to say that if you spend 10,000 hours doing something, you'll be super good at it, I don't think that's quite, uh, is quite as simple as that. What you do is you do about 50 hours, and 90% drop out because they don't like it or they're not good. You know, you do another 50 hours, and 90% drop out. So there's these constant cycles, and you do have to be lucky enough, but also fanatical enough to keep going. And so the person who makes it to 10,000 hours is not just somebody who's done it for 10,000 hours. They're somebody who's chosen and been chosen in many different times. And so all these magical things uh, came together, mm -hmm. uh, including who I know in that, that time. And I, I think uh, you know, that's very important. When you look at somebody who's good and say, could I do it like them? Uh, They've gone through so many cycles that it may fool you that, you know, yes, yes, you could with the, with the right luck, imagination, and, and some, some talent. So what I pick up from what Bill Gates said there was some things around, you know, 10,000 hours is a nice way of packaging this, but really, if you're going to spend 10,000 hours doing something, you probably have some high level of interest in doing something and that people might pursue it for a certain amount of time, but then they're just gonna drop off and pursue something else. It says more about them uh, and their interest and their skills and abilities in this thing to just persist for that long, um, rather than it just being around this, this a simple number and that anyone anyone can do it. So <laughs> I, I think it's interesting now to hear from about what Tim Ferriss has to say, because uh, again, he has some interesting thoughts and, and critiques about the 10,000 hour rule. If you are through God-given skill, uh, capable of becoming the best in the world at X, mm -hmm. I, have a, I feel typically people know that early on. Hmm. I mean, if you're Tiger Woods and you're, 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 instead of drawing pirate ships, you're drawing trajectories of different irons, I'm not kidding, I saw this drawing. It's like, yeah, that, okay, <laughs> that's not normal. <laughs> that's not normal. Uh, <laughs> but 
for most, for most people, I feel like they have the capacity to be exceptionally good in the top 5% in the world in many different areas, but they may not have or be able to identify the raw attributes that are going to push them into you know, bobsledding because there are only so many things that you can try. Uh, and, and, and for me, I just, to, to try to become, I could try to become perfect in Japanese, which of course will never happen because I won't be perfect in English. Uh, or I could, I could get to the point where I can converse like this in maybe, you know, 20 languages by the end of my life. And it's just more appealing. I thought that was really interesting that Tim said, you know, most people can be pretty good at most things. Uh, you know, it's just about deciding which ones and, and we can't sample all of them. So we've just got to pick a few and, and do it that way. And I liked what he said about that he he thinks that becoming the best in the world at something is, is something that you know early on, and it's something that he personally is not really that interested in doing. He, you know, like with the language example, you know, he'd rather be conversational in many languages rather than a, a really deep specialist on one language. I thought that was an interesting idea where he'd rather you know be good at a lot of things rather than really good at one particular thing. And, and that's what we're going to talk about now, is this idea of range. And range is this idea that kind of, um, par like, partially runs counter to the 10,000 hour idea. But what we're talking about now is, well, we've previously discussed, you know, music and, and chess and how people that have are successful in these fields have been working at them really hard for, for 10 years. And what we're going to talk about now is more of a Tim Ferriss kind of approach where instead of being really specifically really good at one specific thing, we're going to be kind of good at, at more things and see how that uh, that approach plays out. And and someone that's done a lot of research on this on this idea of range is David Epstein. And so he has a book called Range. It's Range, David Epstein. It's a fantastic book. It's one of my favorite books. And I've mentioned it in some of the podcast episodes that I've done. We're going to skip to him in a second and he's going to explain this idea and kind of how he how he thinks about it and and really one of the one of the one of the main examples that he uses to describe this idea okay build out Roger versus Tiger because that's a beautifully simple way of illustrating this argument okay so Tiger Woods probably even even for people who don't know his story you've probably absorbed at least the gist of it which is seven months old his father gives him a putter not trying to train him to be a golfer but just gives him a putter he starts carrying it around in his baby walker at 10 months he starts imitating a swing he was physically precocious two years old he's on national television two years old the CDC development benchmarks are stands on tiptoes and kicks a ball and he went on television and showed his driving off in front of Bob Hope basically um, by three his father was media training him um, at four, he started hustling people, basically. You know, he's famous as a teenager. By 21, he's the greatest golfer in the world. Roger Federer, maybe the most famous development story in the history of anything. Mm -hmm. um, Roger Federer, meanwhile, played about a dozen different skiing, skateboarding, badminton, tennis, basketball, soccer, all these things. Um, mother was a tennis coach, refused to coach him because he wouldn't return balls normally. She said it was no fun. Um, when his coaches tried to bump him up a level. He declined because he just wanted to talk about pro wrestling with his friends after practice. Uh, when he finally got good enough to warrant an interview with a local newspaper, and the reporter asked him if he ever became a pro, what he would buy with his first paycheck, he said a Mercedes, and his mother was appalled and asked if she could hear the yeah. interview recording, and, and he had actually said Mercedes in a Swiss-German accent. He just wanted more CDs. Oh. And, <laughs> um, and, so then she was like, okay, we're doing okay. His, his father had no rules, just said, don't cheat, don't care anything else. And he specialized, year, he continued playing badminton and basketball, soccer, specialized years after. Um, what, at what age years. is Roger Federer really only playing tennis? Um, Mid-teen years, basically, where he's only doing tennis. But he still continues to non-formally play soccer, even yeah. when he's doing that. Yeah. Um, and, and other informal sports continues with them, even after that. Um, and the question basically was, which one of these models is the norm? Like, yeah. which one should we extrapolate nope. from? Some really interesting ideas there from David and this research that he shared is, is really, really important important for us. And when he talks about, you know, which, uh, which of these two scenarios should we extrapolate from and kind of build our lives around, one of the common mainstream ideas is really this early specialization 10,000 hours rule, right, where we've got to specialize early like Tiger Woods. I mean, that's maybe too early. <laughs> he's special, like he's, he knows he's going to be a golfer from when he's quite young, uh, you know, when he's like a couple months old, basically. But 
you know, should we take this approach where early specialization or should we wait and, uh, and do sort of more of the Roger Federer approach where we play around with a bunch of different things and then we specialize later? You know, it's an interesting, uh, interesting idea and, and one that I spoke about with Adam Ashton on episode 12 of the podcast. And here is his thoughts on this idea of range compared to the 10,000 hour rule. The, yeah. So for me, there was a real eye opener and just seeing, okay, yeah, there is like the specialist and the, and the generalist. And we kind of rebranded it into like going wide versus going deep. Like, yeah, if you want to, if there is an area that you want to specialize in and it does make sense that it is like more of a, a golf or more of a chess type of profession where there is a clear answer and a clear way to do it, the way to achieve success is to be the best person at that, which means working the hardest at that one niche sort of field and getting, going really, really deep. And the books that kind of link with that is like the outliers by Malcolm Gladwell talking about Anders Ericsson's, the 10,000 hours rule saying like the, the vinyl violinists who had practiced for 10,000 hours achieved mastery. So it's saying, okay, if if you want to go deep in something, get your 10,000 hours, work really hard, work more than everybody else, learn more than everybody else, achieve better things than everybody else. We also kind of linked in grit by Angela Duckworth saying that, okay, well, along the path, it's going to be bloody tough. So you need a bit of grit to get you through. You need to be picking the right thing to go deep at and then using grit to get through to those 10,000 hours. And really the end of that journey, you do become a master in your field and you do become successful if that's the path that you choose. Um, And it's a very viable path to success. But it's not the only path to success. I think a lot of people probably think that is the only path is to work really, really hard at one thing and become the best at that. Um, But there is another way to achieving success, which is going wide, the generalist approach, which we like the book's range, as I said, by David Epstein and originals by Adam Grant, saying that it's not just the one who works the hardest. Maybe it's the one who's done, you know, two years in this, three years in this, two years over here, another four years over here. And at the time, it kind of looks like a weird path. They're jumping around from different things. They're learning different skills that seem somewhat unrelated at the time but then sort of magically at the end they come around to this point where they find the intersection of all these different skills they find the synergies they find the ways to stack all these things together so they become the best in this one sort of niche intersection of all these different things that nobody else could possibly do because they haven't built up all the different skills um and yeah as you say you're probably a a bit more biased towards that because that's kind of the path you're on and that's definitely me as well but i think that it holds a lot of merit and i think that just knowing that there is a different path rather than just to pick one thing and work really hard at it, knowing that there is, if you do want to jump around from different things, make sure, don't just like jump around, quit something because you don't like it, and then try something else and quit it because you don't like it. You need that bit of intentionality around it, around what different skills are you building that then one day at the end, it seems like you might be a failure at the start. And then at the end, you magically have stacked all these different things together to achieve your, your different success. So Adam did a great job there of breaking this problem down into kind of the specialist versus the generalist. So the specialist is kind of the Tiger Woods and the generalist is more of a Roger Federer type approach. And that's not to say that the generalist doesn't have actual skills because certainly Roger Federer is still the best in the world at tennis, but he has more of that background, whereas Tiger Woods is, is, is still sort of only a golfer, whereas Roger Federer could probably play a few other sports and still be quite good. And so I want to dive into this idea further, you know, and and, and the reasons why specifically this range idea and the idea of having some broader experiences is is a a better approach than specializing early, okay? Because there are quite a few, and we're going to go through them now. So the, the first of these is something that David Epstein calls match quality. And then we're going to talk about how uh, long-term success requires a broad base. So, you know, being able to succeed in the long term requires a broad, um, you know, range of experiences. And then we're also going to talk about, you know, short-term thinking and how this plays out um, in, in in the context of range. So, again, we're going to hear from David a lot throughout and we're going to hear from from Malcolm Gladwell as well who's who's the the guy behind the 10,000 hour rule Uh, and the first thing we're going to dive into is this idea of match quality and so match quality is this idea of you know let's say I I play a sport I play soccer and I I start playing and I, I don't really know which position I'm best at. So maybe I'm a good goalkeeper, maybe I'm a good defender, maybe I'm a good striker, I don't know. So maybe I start off as a defender, yeah, I kind of go okay. Um, You know, maybe a specialist approach would be start as a defender, the best way to be good as a defender is just to to play 
only as a defender and get better. And the reason why I'm not good at it is just because I haven't spent enough time doing it. But alternatively, we can take the range approach and play a few different positions in the team, work out where the highest match quality of myself would be. Or So that might mean I play in the midfield. I, might, I, I, play, I play as a striker. I play up, uh, you know, scoring the goals. And, and, then, and then from there, we can say, okay, which of these was I best at? Now we can start to specialize and start to take things a bit more seriously. And now that I've experienced a different variety of, you know, I've, I've experienced the game more fully in that I've, I've seen what it's like to be a defender. I've seen what it's like to be a midfielder. I've seen what it's like to be a striker. I can put the position I'm in in, in of the broader context of the game. I understand all the different roles better. And, and now I've also worked out where my skills are best suited. Okay, so let's say I, I play as a striker and I find out that I'm really good at scoring goals. I, I can you know I can score goals quite easily. Okay, then we've worked out that my match quality for being a striker is very high. I'm like I, I'm my skills and attributes are matched are a very high match for being a striker. And so that's what sampling allows you to do. Is it allows me to work out okay which position in the team am I actually best at? And, and, you know, and, and then we can go from there. And so this is the first thing we're going to talk about, and, and David has his explanation on this here. So having seen this sort of surprising pattern in sports and music, I started to wonder about domains that affect even more people, like education. And an economist found a natural experiment in the higher ed systems of England and Scotland. In the period he studied, the systems were very similar, except in England, students had to specialize in their mid-teen years to pick a specific course of study to apply to, whereas in Scotland, they could keep trying things in university if they wanted to. And his question was, who wins the trade-off, the early or the late specializers? And what he saw was that the early specializers jump out to an income lead because they have more domain-specific skills. The late specializers get to try more different things, and when they do pick, they have better fit, or what economists call match quality. And so their growth rates are faster. By six years out, they erase that income gap, Meanwhile, the early specializers start quitting their career tracks in much higher numbers, essentially because they were made to choose so early that they more often made poor choices. So the late specializers lose in the short term and win in the long run. And I think if we thought about career choice like dating, we might not pressure people to settle down quite so quickly. Really interesting to hear there that early specializers actually, you know, are less likely to enjoy what they do and like less likely to continue doing that thing. Um, whereas people that specialize later or choose the thing that they're going to do to a deeper level later end up earning more and end up persevering more down that road as well really really interesting stuff and the next part we want to talk about today is how success like building success or long-term success requires building a broad base and in this idea we're going to go deeper into this specialization versus general specialist and generalist ideas um we're going to understand that there are two kind of environments. One is called a kind environment. And, and these are things like chess and music, where specializing early is actually beneficial. The tasks are repetitive. Uh, the tasks can kind of be easily automated. Um, and, and, it, and, and practice is really, you, you need to practice at that thing quite a lot. The rules are quite um, well-defined. You know, things are quite are set out quite well. Whereas if we look at wicked environments, and this is what David Epstein calls wicked environments, these are environments where the rules aren't that clear. Things are constantly changing all the time. It's not really a set field of play. There's, there's stuff happening. Uh, like the rules are changing. The game is changing all the time. And and in each of these environments, there's certain strategies that work better. So in a kind environment, things like chess uh, golf, music, in these environments, you know, the early specialization method is something that is is, is really useful and, and is, is necessary to achieve a higher level of skill. But in environments that are wicked, the environments where the game is less well-defined, that's where it's important to have more of a breadth because you're going to be applying skills in it unique and novel ways. And so it's important that you then have a larger amount of experiences, a large amount of different experiences to draw on rather than just the same set of experiences. But yeah, here is David Epstein explaining this concept in more detail. Like if there was some recent research from LinkedIn that showed like people who, who become successful executives, one of the best predictors is the number of job functions they've worked across within an industry. Or 
again, to go to this obsession with precocity, when Mark Zuckerberg was 22 and he said, young people are just smarter. And MIT Northwestern and the Census Bureau just has research out showing that the average age of a founder of a blockbuster startup on the day of founding, not even when it becomes a blockbuster, is about 46. Yeah. Um, but like the Tiger story, we just focus on the Zuckerberg story, but actually people have to zigzag usually quite a bit before they find that, that ground, because the goal isn't initially clear like it is in, in kind learning environments. Yeah. David also has some thoughts on planning your career with this kind of mindset. Like if we are saying, okay, we're going to try a bunch of different stuff, how does this actually work in, in terms of planning? You know, where, How do we go about thinking about things like a five or a 10 year plan and, and a kind of a long term vision for our career and kind of things that we want to be doing, the problems that we want to be solving for the long term? And David simply says that for himself, He's, he's purely a short-term thinker. He doesn't actually consider much in the long term. And the short-term thinking and jumping to kind of the thing that he's most interested in or the, the next, you know, allows him to just naturally create this range along the way and naturally allows him to have unique and really cool experiences. But here's him talking about it now. One program um, that I learned about while I was researching is called Career Academies that targets kids who, you know, are... are by traditional measures, not, not really headed to college and gives them some sort of vocational training, basically, or early exposure to, to types of work. And surprisingly, even when they often do not decide to go in to do anything with that career, they still do better overall, like in income-wise, going to do something totally, totally different. And, and I think a little bit of that has to do, again, they're getting more significant sort of signal about themselves and about match quality than you often do in traditional classes. Yeah, yeah. When is, um, speaking of match quality, uh, presumably, you can keep searching forever. I mean, I have no idea what I'm going to do when I grow up. I literally have no idea what I'm going to do now. Like, no idea. I mean, when I was a teenager, I thought I was going to go to the Air Force Academy, be a test pilot, and be an astronaut. And I've gotten, like, linearly less long-term goal-directed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether, um, uh, whether your, your particular position right now as a best-selling author is generalizable to the general public. No, no, I mean, but, but this was, but in the, 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 the Dark Horse project, in the book, the, the, the common trait of people who find fulfillment in their careers is a focus on short-term planning. And, and that yeah. resonated with me so much such that I ended up as a subject in the study, which I disclose in the book. Um, what they do is they all came in and would say, well, you know, don't tell people to do what I did because I came through this weird path where I thought I was going to do one thing, and then I tried it, I didn't like it, so I zig and zag. And, and they all view themselves as having come out of nowhere, which is why the researchers called it the Dark Horse Project. Mm -hmm. And their common trait is this short-term planning, where they don't look around and say, here's who's younger than me and has more than me. They say, here's who I am right now, here are my skills and interests, here are the opportunities in front of me, I'll try this one, here's my hypothesis about what I'll learn, and a year from now I'll change because I will have learned something new. And they just do that until they get to a spot where they can kind of uniquely succeed and feel fulfilled. And so I've totally abandoned that, that longer-term planning in favor of these short-term proactive experiments. And, and why would you have to stop? You can keep doing that your whole yeah. life. Really interesting stuff there from David. This idea of short-term planning almost runs a little bit contrary to modern career advice or, you know, things where it's like, you know, plan out the next five years and then, you know, work out where you can, where, from there, plan your next one year and then from there, plan this or this or whatever. Like, and you know, everyone wants to have that sense of security almost of, you know, where their kind of general life direction is headed. But I think this is really interesting um, for him to raise that, you know, a, that a lot of people that actually find more, you know, success and fulfillment, etc., are really only thinking about what is the next best thing for them to do. And, th and that doesn't necessarily have to be in the same field or in the same in the same industry or whatever it might be, but you know, jumping around and, and pursuing exciting opportunities is is uh, you know is encouraged, and it's not necessarily the case where where we're saying you know disregard all else and continue down the path of specialization that you're on, because um certainly it sounds like certainly from the research has shared that's not the most effective approach. Another really, really interesting piece to come out of this whole concept is this idea of skill stacking. And this is something that I spoke about with, uh, with Dan Brockwell in episode 15 of the podcast. We were talking about the benefits of range and kind of when you have these skills, similar to what Tim Ferriss was talking about earlier in this episode, where we've got certain skills built up to a certain point. We might not necessarily be the best in the world at, either, at, at each of these individually, but if we combine them together, then we can create something really special. And here's Dan explaining this for us. Scott Adams 
was, you know, he was a funny guy. He could tell jokes, but he wasn't the world's best comedian. He was a decent artist. He could draw, but he wasn't the world's best, you know, artist. And he worked in kind of like, you know, corporate culture and offices and all that, but like wasn't like the best corporate worker. But the intersection of those three things allowed him to create a really unique intersection. It allowed him to create like a humorous comic about office culture. And so just by being better than average at a several things, he found the intersection of those things and then was able to get a really big win on the board. And so when it comes to being a general, it's like, okay, the range thesis, and I, and I haven't read range, so forgive me if I misinterpreted the thesis. I think that, like, yes, like it's great, like start off early, explore a lot of things, but you'll find some things that you more naturally gravitate towards or some things that really in, you really enjoy, some things that really energize you. I think the magic comes from finding like the two to three things you're best at, maybe three to four, and thinking about, okay, what's the intersection of those? And when I say best at, it could be a skill or it could be a knowledge about a certain area. So maybe you've spent a lot of time in the sustainability space, like you've been working on sustainability and maybe you also love making TikToks, right? As in like, you know, you're a very avid user of social media. You're, you're good at like, you know, short form content creation, good at doing funny stuff. You might then create like a sustainability TikTok channel. So it's about like, I always think about intersections, intersections, intersections. Every person has such a beautiful, rich and complex story in their life. And we will all encounter different things and we'll all be great at certain things. And so it's like, how do you just tap into, you know, what your, your strengths are and combine them into, I think what's a unique offering that no one else can do because no one else is you like James, you are, you're the best at being you, James specifically. There are other mm. good Jameses. I don't want to insult them. I have, I have several friends named James, but I, I think it's such, a, <laughs> it's such a fascinating piece there, right? Really interesting insights there from Dan, and it's a great way to think about your career, right, in terms of what are the things that I'm both interested in and good at, and where is the intersection between those things, um, and, and, you know, what is something unique that I can provide to the world, and it, and if you can think about those things, uh, you know, and, and perhaps grow certain skills, then you can really build something that is quite unique, and it's something that only you can do, and so I thought that's really good, and that, that, and, and that, that is another another element of this this idea of range and building a set of broad experiences so that we can bring unique insights and, and things that differentiate us into new areas. We're coming close to the end of this episode now and I want to finish off with a piece from David Epstein's TED Talk on this topic and I'll highly recommend watching the TED Talk and, and lots of the other content that I've shared if, if, if you'd like to go deeper on this concept. But in this last piece, he talks about how often in society we are kind of pressured to become specialists early. You know, we're often we're, we're often told, you know, go and, and and do this thing and and become really great as fast as possible in this one specific area. When in reality, what the world needs and what is often a better approach is to sample many different areas, um, pursue multiple different things, and then. Um, and, and then that way you'll be able to see new new problems in unique ways and you'll be able to make the world uh, a better place. But yeah, here is David Epstein in his TED Talk. I think in the well-meaning drive for a head start, we often even counterproductively short circuit even the way we learn new material at a fundamental level. In a study last year, seventh grade math classrooms in the US were randomly assigned to different types of learning. Some got what's called blocked practice. That's like you get problem type A, 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 B, 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 and so on. Progress is fast, kids are happy, everything's great. Other classrooms got assigned to what's called interleaved practice. That's like if you took all the problem types and threw them in a hat and drew them out at random. Progress is slower, kids are more frustrated, but instead of learning how to execute procedures, they're learning how to match a strategy to a type of problem. And when the test comes around, the interleave group blew the block practice group away. It wasn't even close. Now, I found a lot of this research deeply counterintuitive. The idea that a head start, whether in picking a career or a course of study or just in learning new material, can sometimes undermine long-term development. And naturally, I think there are as many ways to succeed as there are people. But I think we tend only to incentivize and encourage the tiger path, when increasingly in a wicked world, we need people who travel the Roger path as well, or as the eminent physicist and mathematician and wonderful writer, Freeman Dyson, put it, and he, Dyson passed away yesterday, so I hope I'm doing his words honor here, as he said, for a healthy ecosystem, we need both birds and frogs. Frogs are down in the mud seeing all the granular details. 
the birds are soaring up above, not seeing those details, but integrating the knowledge of the frogs. And we need both. The problem, Dyson said, is that we're telling everyone to become frogs. And I think, in a wicked world, that's increasingly short-sighted. Thank you very much. So there we go. I think that's a nice note to end this episode on. Specializing early can be useful and we need people that do that. But certainly, if you if you aren't specializing early and you're taking more of the range route, uh, taking in a diverse range of experiences in your career, that is certainly a very valid path to take. I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode today. It's been great being able to share this with you. If you did enjoy this episode, please give it a like give it a share and what you can do is you can subscribe to the graduate theory newsletter at graduatetheory.com where you can get emails uh, every single week with uh, with each episode and my takeaways thanks again for listening to this episode today and we'll see you next week